Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Rokade, consultant rhinologist and Andreas Kalbe, surgeon from Winchester and the University Hospital Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of our organizing team to this inaugural Winter Global Rhinology Endoscopic Sinus and Andreas Kalbe Surgery Webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a registered non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery. We have successfully hosted annual multi-center live surgical webcast, The Lioness, since 2014 in collaboration with Lion Foundation. Thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it. More than 2,000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for GRACE 2020. We will have hugely informative and engaging sessions presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons from around the world. GRACE 2020 is hosted at the Global Telemedicine Studio of Professor Wilco Gronman in Utrecht in Netherlands. It is supported by Medtronic and Carl Stores. Thank you. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology, featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality, Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you. Our next presenter uh, is Mr. Sal Nair. Uh, he'll be presenting on uh, techniques on the basic uh, endoscopic uh, sinus surgery approaches to the sphenoid. And further on, uh, he'll be discussing the classification and anatomy of uh, frontal sinus. So can I, uh, Luis Melia. Luis is a rhinology colleague from uh, Glasgow. Uh, she had just recently joined University Hospital for uh, as an Andreas Kalbe surgeon and rhinologist. So, Louise, can I request you to uh, host the session? Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Ashok. So, um, I'm very pleased to present Associate Pre uh, Professor Sally Nair. So, we're very pleased to have him here today. Professor Nair, um, he works in Auckland, New Zealand, and he completed his training in the UK before then spending a year in Adelaide with Professor PJ Wormworld. He has a higher MD degree, and he's also been appointed as Associate Professor at the University of Auckland. After working as a consultant in the UK for approximately 10 years, Professor Muir then went to New Zealand and continued his work on advanced sinus surgery and the management of skull-based tumours, and he also has vast experience with frontal sinus surgery, including low throat procedures. He has published widely, including numerous book chapters, and with the privilege today of hearing not one, but two talks, the first of which is on basic phase techniques and approaches to the sphenoid sinus. And the second is going to be on frontal sinus anatomy and specifically looking at the um, frontal sinus anatomy and the international frontal sinus anatomy classification. Thank you. Thanks very much. What a great introduction. Um, thanks for um, um, organizing and to be the host of this conference. It looks like it's gonna be a great event. So I'm gonna crack on for um, time purposes to try and stick to time. Uh, can you see my presentation?
It's not coming up at the moment, Sal, maybe. Let me just, let me just try that again and see if I can share this. Hang on a second. That says no, thank you. Yeah, okay, let me put that up. Is that good? That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. So, look, I hope I'm not teaching you all to suck eggs, but really I, I want to talk about the basic principles of um, endoscopic sinus surgery. There are some wonderful talks that you're going to be exposed to over the next um, oh, day or two. But you really need to start at the beginning. And these are things that have helped me out when I started with Fez. Uh, and I hopefully they'll be able to help you out when you get going with your endoscopic sinus surgery. So my objectives are simple. Um, I want to go through some basic anatomy, and Tim has covered that beautifully in his preceding talk, which was very helpful. Um, some very simple preoperative considerations, some things that you might want to consider to make your life easier. The basic concepts are of sinus surgery. So how do you get from this? Here's a patient, a typical patient who's got, you know, ethmoidal disease, maxillary sinus disease, frontal rhesus disease. How do you get from that to this? Um, and that's what you want to try and achieve for your patients. Patients who, and believe me, not all patients end up looking as good as this, but you want patients to end up having a result where you've got complete clearance of all of those air cells in the sciences um, so that you minimize your revision surgery aspects. So very briefly, and I'm not going to cover this in any detail, um, to get your best results, you need to make sure that you're offering the patients the right operation and that's really based on your history, your examination, and the imaging that Tim went through. But of course, they don't all go straight to surgery. They have to try their optimum or the most fit medical therapy for that individual patient. And briefly, that may include steroids. It may include the topical nasal steroid of your choice, um, antibiotics if you think it's appropriate, um, and you know, rinses, which we know have very good evidence. So. Once your patients have been through all of this treatment, you then make the decision to go ahead with surgery. So if we move straight to surgery now, what are the things that are going to improve your surgical field when you're operating? Practically everybody here uses some kind of preparation to prep the nose. Uh, this is a slide which I've just recently tweaked, but I was looking back and it's like 15 years, 16 years old. Um, so I haven't particularly changed much what I do, I use topical cocaine, um, I use neuropathies, um, and I use local anesthetic um, injections inside the nose. And those local an anesthetic injections can be a combination of marcaine or it can be xylestacin, whatever you like to use. The next step you use to get your um, hemostasis inside the nose and get that maximum decongestion is really important at the beginning of your surgery. When I'm operating with residents and I see people struggling, Often it's because the nose has not been prepped properly. So if you take your time to prep the nose right at the beginning, putting the patties in the middle meatus, posture in the middle meatus, along the inferior turbinate, or the base of the, um, the middle turbinate lamella, you'll get the maximum decongestion. So just think about those things because your operation starts right at the outset to get your best results. Let's see if I can move this forward. Um, so here we go. This is a local anesthetic injection, um, just ex uh, injecting the axilla of the middle turbinate. You can see there's some fungal type debris um, in, in this person's middle meters. And then I'm putting another injection um, into that stump of that middle turbinate. Just at the attachment of the nose wall. I don't like lots of injection holes inside the nose because the more sites you prick the nose, the more spots of blood they're going to be. So limit your local anesthetic injections to one or two areas. We like using tranexamic acid um, right at the outset. We all get a gram of um, TXA. Um, and certainly I find that's helped me latterly um, compared to previously. Um, look at this picture on the right. Full of blood, full of water. Look how dark that is. The moment you suck out the postnasal space, your image improves. Now that is a really simple thing to do, but you'll be amazed how many people forget to suck out the postnasal space. Most of your light is absorbed by the blood, by that red pigment that sits around the nose. Why is it that by the end of the operation, everything looks so dark and it's always much more difficult and frustrating? So take your time to irrigate the nose, lots of warm saline, and to suck out the postnasal space regularly. I always, practically always pull out the nasal hairs at the front of the nose 
and everyone laughs at me when I did, but I was taught to do it at my fellowship and I continue to do that. And that stops you soiling your endoscope when you push it in and out of the, the nasal cavity because it always gets covered in blood. So pull as many of those hairs out of the beginning of the operation and you'll get less frustrated as you go through your surgery. General anesthetic measures. It's good to work with an anesthetist that you have confidence in, somebody who you work with regularly. Most of our patients do not get tubed. They don't get paralyzed. They have an LMA, um, total intravenous anesthetic. Um, for longer cases, you might tube them. And the most important thing uh, when you're working with your anesthetist is to try and work with them to get a good field. And I ask my anesthetist if they can provide me with a bradycardic anesthetic, rather than saying, can you give me hypotension? Because if you say hypertension, you know, they might, if they're giving an inhalation agent, they might just turn it up and then you get peripheral vasodilatation, which gives you hypertension, but it also makes your, your field much worse. So don't be afraid of asking for bradycardia. Beta blockers work really well, but so does TIVA, total intravenous anesthesia. So here's step one. This is an unsnectomy and middle metal antrostomy. There are lots of ways of doing an unsnectomy. This is a swindle technique popularized by PJ Wormold and involves using a backbiter. Um, if you look at this, and I just want to see whether I can take you back one second to this image. If I just go back in here, right to the outset. If you look at the way this instrument has been introduced into the nasal cavity, it's introduced vertically. It's hooked round the back end of the answer and then turned horizontally. So this is a pediatric backbiter, um, only because there's a bit more finesse with a pediatric backbiter. Um, and then we're using a sickle knife to cut through, not the toppest part of the answer process where it attaches to either the, the middle terminus or the lateral nasal wall. But I'm going slightly lower down because here I'm not carrying out a frontal recess dissection. I'm just doing a simple MMA anterior ethmoid. And then you fracture out that unsnet using a ball probe and then using a through biting Blakesley, you remove its attachment to the lateral nasal wall. Once you've done that, you expose the bottom end of the unsnet process. And this is really where the unsnet articulates with the superior edge of the inferior turbinate. And you can fill it that out very carefully by using your fine end of your ball probe. Just fill it out that piece of bone so that you can then keep as much mucosa undisturbed as you fill it out that unsnet process. You can also keep the back end, that common drainage pathway intact as well at the back here, um, but you've got a nice, healthy, mucosally apposition area. I like using transition spaces, and I'll just show you that. So I'll pause the video there because so far I've used all the natural spaces to open up into the next room or the next compartment. So I'm not punching through this bulla, um, in a blind fashion, I'm using the ball probe to seek the space behind the bullet and then fracture it forward and then remove that tissue with the microdebrider or a 45 degree Blake sleep. And I'm exposing it right up to that laminar preparation. So now you're looking at essentially the ground lamella, which is perforated by the posterior ethmoid. So this vertical structure here is an important structure to appreciate. The ground lamella turns horizontally this is the vertical portion and it turns horizontally at the bottom here where it then attaches to the lateral nasal wall so where do the posterior ethmoids begin so tim i think might have alluded to this this is a great picture taken from the late heinz stamberger's book here and it really crystallizes the position of the middle turban and how it attaches the lateral nasal wall and you can see the middle turban has this horizontal portion and then this vertical portion. We always enter the posterior ethmoids at the junction between the horizontal and the vertical portion where this black star is marked. But how do you translate that to a CT scan? Because when you're operating at any single point in time, you need to know exactly where you are on your scan. So the posterior ethmoids really begin where you can see the superior terminate on your scan, because that it translates to the point of which the ground lamella converts and changes over from horizontal to vertical. So when you make your hole and you perforate into that junction, the first structure that I like to see, which gives me some safety, is the bottom end of the superior terminal. Because then I know exactly where I am on the scan, and I know with confidence that I can take everything away from that superior terminal to the laminar papyracea. Let's see how that's done in the next slide. So here we go. So we're looking at 
the bulla here, horizontal portion of the unsnit down here. We've seen this bit as we fracture the bulla forward and we clear the bulla with the microdebrider. So it's the same patient that I've shown you earlier and we're just finessing all of that. But what I really want to show you is this turn of the lamina of the um, ground lamella. So here's a vertical portion, here's a horizontal portion. And I'm using the microdebrider to walk me up that horizontal portion. It's almost always there, even in a revision case, unless you've really completely taken out that middle turbulent. So here we go. We're making an opening between the junction of the horizontal and the vertical portion of the ground lamella. The first thing I'm looking for through that window is that edge of that superior turbulent. There's the edge of my superior turbulent. I'm now confident. I know where my sphenoid is going to lie. I know where the lateral aspect of my dissection is going to be. I know where the medial aspect of my dissection is going to be. So that's just exposing that useful landmark of the superior turbinate. Look at this, much more bloody, okay? But you can look into the maxillary sinus, blood sucked out, much cleaner suddenly. And now you've got a bit of the bulla sitting here. You've got the ground lamella, vertical portion, horizontal portion down here. Just as we've done before, we're going to just clear out that bulla and we'll just debride that bulla using a tricut blade. Once we've debrided the bulla and we've cleared it out the way, get my neuropathy out the way, once we've cleared it out the way, we're then exposing now that horizontal portion of the ground lamella and the vertical po portion of the ground lamella. So I can see really clearly now exactly what my landmarks are. And just like before, walk up that horizontal portion of the ground lamella to the vertical portion and we want to make an opening at the junction between the two. So here we go. I'm just going to find that spot, junction between the two. Just open that slowly. It's polypoid tissue, but don't worry if there's polypoid tissue, just stick to your normal principles that you know, first principles. And there you go, there's the superterminate. You can just see it in the distance there, the superterminate. So now we can clear everything from that superterminate out to the lateral um, aspect of your dissection, which is the um, lamina papyracea. I'm going to move this on to the next slide. So we haven't got to the sphenoid yet. All we've done so far is expose the superior turbinate. But the sphenoid, as Tim alluded to, is quite an important part of your dissection because lots of critical structures lie in the sphenoid. And these pictures on either side show us that. We have the optic nerve and we've got all of the cavernous sinus and the pituitary, etc., all within the sphenoid. So there is a variable anatomy in the sphenoid. Here the optic nerves are sitting nicely um, where you'd expect them to be. Here's a sphenoid moidal cell um, highlighted with the asterisk on the patient's right-hand side. Here you've got a widely pneumatized sphenoid into the base of the pterygoid. You can see sitting really nicely, a great case for doing a vidinerectomy. You've got the vidinear sitting really proudly here and you've also got V2 um, sitting on almost, almost like a mesentery. Here you've got a dehiscent optic nerve and a deep corticooptic recess in the clinal process. So access to the sphenoid is important. Why might we want to access the sphenoid? Well, you could have, as in this patient here, you could have this um, osteotic bone with uh, chronic sphenoid um, sinus disease. You could have um, disease extending within the sphenoid, something like a meningocele. And as Tim showed us earlier on, this is a very common point to get a, a dehiscence in the lateral wall of the sphenoid around V2. Um, and there you can see in the MRI scan uh, what that might look like. Or you could have a large tumor extending um, out from the pterygoid palatine fossa, infratemporal fossa into the sphenoid, or a large pituitary mass. So all of these require access to the sphenoid and how you access the sphenoid depends really on what your pathology is. In most instances, if we want to access the sphenoid, we would do it either transnasally or we'd go transethmoidally. Um, so I'm just going to go back here. It's important here to use the sphenoid sinus safely. Um, it's the gateway to the central skull base, so it needs a bit of respect. Um, practically all the patients, if I'm not doing skull base surgery, the sphenoid is accessed transethmoidally, exactly as I showed you by finding the superior turbinate. You can access it transeptally, and in the days gone by when we used to do the um, um, open access sphenoid sinus surgery. Sorry, I'm just gonna, my dog's just gone bananas. I'm just on the uh, webinar. Um, 
we used to be able to go transeptally, um, but I don't I hardly do that anymore now because everything's done endoscopically. So let's identify the sphenoid ostium. So here we go. I'm just moving that superotibin out the way, and you can see that sphenoid ostium about 12 to 14, 12 to 15 millimeters above the posterior carini. How do you know that's the distance? Use your microdebrider. It's a four millimeter microdebrider, and walk it up that posterior carini. It's about four microdebrider breaths up to the top. So that's one way of finding it. What's the next way? The sphenoid ostium lies at the same plane as the orbital floor. So if you're lost, find the orbital floor in your maxillary antrum and walk across and you'll find the sphenoid ostium is in the same plane. Here we go, superiturbinate, there's the sphenoid ostium. People often say to me, but that isn't at the same level. It is. If you put your freers in there and you push down, you will come to the floor of three node sinus and it is the same level as your orbital floor. What's the other way of finding it? Well, as Tim said, it is most often medial for superterm. It can be lateral, but it is extremely rare to find it laterally. Um, certainly, it's not something that I worry about that I'm missing it because it's 99% of the time it's medial. Um, but this is what I want to show you. I want to show you finding that um, sphenoid sinus opening by identifying the superior turbinate. So here we go, we've done the same thing again. We've gone through our grand lamella, we're finding out our superior turbinate. Here she is, here comes our superior turbinate. And we want to take away the lower third of that superior turbinate. So if we slowly keep removing this, the lower third, and remember, you need to take the lower third all the way posteriorly, not just the lower third in its anterior segment, but the lower third all the way to its attachment to the lateral wall, sorry, to the posterior wall. And now I'm using a kerosene forceps um, or high punch to open that sphenoid in a median L shape. And I'll show you that in a minute. So this is a sphenoid opened up here, widely opened up, and I've stayed close to the nasal septum and along the floor. And there's always a bit of bleeding down the bottom here. Don't worry about it. The posterior septal artery, if you don't get bleeding, you haven't gone low enough. So just cauterize that posterior septal artery and that's all you need to do. So that's opening that sphenoid safely as you can in a median L shape. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, so we'll just cauterize that. So this is what I mean by a median L. This is looking at the right sphenoid. So once you've got your sphenoid ostium and you've put your probe in it and you've identified it, you can then vertically either use your microbrider and stay and hug the nasal septum and then go along the floor. Once you've opened this L shape, you can then widen that ostium because you stayed in the safest position to open that sphenoid. And then it doesn't matter what instrument you use. You can use a mushroom punch or a debrider or a kerosene, just as long as you've got your landmarks correct right at the outset. This is a wide opening. This is pre-pituitary, so you can see um, you've got a nice opening of the pituitary fossa. We've drilled out the septum and the sphenoid is widely opened. Now, what do you do at the end of the procedure? Um, uh, you know, it's the days of packing, um, what do you stick up inside the nose? So here I'm using Cardigel, inside the nose Cardigel with Kenacort, um, uh, which is a fantastic product um, uh, made of um, uh, squid X skeleton. Um, and it's great for healing and hemostasis. So at the end of the procedure, make sure you use some kind of diathermy so that you um, control all those usual suspect areas, um, the middle term, inferior term, if you're doing a uh, terminoplasty and that posterior septal vessel. As I said right the acid, we use tranexamic acid and we use tranexamic acid really on induction. Um, I don't give it uh, post-surgically because I find that the clots get very hard inside the nose. Nasal dressings, if you have none and you don't use any, that's great, brilliant. Um, I find cardiogel just helps with the healing process I and mean, you see them at two to four weeks, they're brilliant. Pure region gel is another hyaluronic acid-based dressing, or you can use nasal pool soaked in whatever is the flavor of the month, really. Um, so my key points are, an anatomic knowledge is, anatomical knowledge is really, really key, obviously, for any kind of surgical procedure, but even more so important than sinus surgery, where you're operating in the confines of a tiny space um, with the orbit um, and the um, skull base close to you. Study your scans, use whatever mnemonic you find useful so that you're not caught out by a dehiscent orbit or 
um, a retraction unsnip process or, or a sphenoid moidal cell or low-lying skull base or whatever it is. Just study your scans every single time. Work well with anesthetists. Get them to give you the best anesthetic they can. And, uh, and if that's bradycardia they can offer you, brilliant. Aim for heart rate of the low 50s. Have a plan. Not all patients need all their sciences opening up. Um, make sure you're doing the best for your patient. And always, always minimize collateral damage. You should have economy of movement when you're operating. Um, make sure that you're not sticking things in and out your nose blindly and taking instruments out and bumping into things. Always pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, and think about your post-op review, review plan and debridement. When you're gonna see them, when you're gonna fit them in, how long are you gonna give them? Because ultimately you want the best results for your patients. I think that's me done for, yeah, for that talk. How did I do time-wise? Not bad. Good. Absolutely perfect time-wise. Thank you very much for that excellent talk. I think everyone will really appreciate that. And I think it's so important not to underestimate the importance of these techniques that you've described in basic phase, because it's only once we've mastered that that we can then really go on to develop the more advanced techniques. There, were, there was a few questions just from, from the, the, um, the delegates, and also I had a question myself, if that was all right. Sure. So could I, can I ask just one question? When you're training, do you go straight to the powered instruments, or do you tend to use cold steel instruments for the, for the trainees in, a first, in the first instance for phase? So um, there's always a mix of both instruments, pad and, um, uh, and the cold steel. I mean, part of the operation is done with cold steel. I don't like them using pad instruments for everything. For example, I don't like them using it on the unsmith process um, because I think that's the easiest way to go right out of the operation and then wreck your confidence. Um, so I like them to just use cold steel for those bits, but I do like them to use a mic debrider because it makes it a lot easier for polyp surgery, et cetera. But I also like them to use kerosene punch forceps through biting Blakesley. So it's a combination of both. It's not that because they're junior that I won't, I don't like them to use instruments. It's just that I think other bits are done better with other, other instruments, that's all. And I try and tell them the areas where I think they're going to be in danger if they use a micro debrider. And the areas where I think they're actually safe, safer to use a micro debrider. Um, so yeah, I, I get them to mix them both. I make a mixture of all. And one of the questions that a couple of people had asked was about the tranexamic acid. Now, my understanding of that was it, it prevents the breakdown of clots. So therefore, unless there's a history of um, embolus, we're safe to use it. Would you Correct. agree with that? And are you, are you ha have you had any adverse incidents? No, no. And actually, even, even in people who've had um, sort of minimal sort of emboli or P symptoms, the anesthetists and people are very happy giving um, a gram. So yeah, there's very, very, very contra very few contraindications using TXA, very few. I don't use it topically um, as much. I used to use it a lot 10 years ago, um, but because I use cardigel more now, I don't use it topically. That's lovely, Professor Nair. So I think Ashok, if you're, if you're happy, we'll maybe move on for the sake of time to the second presentation. You happy with that, Ashok? I think you're on mute, Ashok, at the moment. I am happy to move, Louise, if you're happy for me to move on. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, just let me know if I'm sharing my screen. Is my screen being shared? No. Let me do that. Uh, let's do that now. Uh, right, there we go. That's it, lovely. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to spend uh, only 15 minutes really on this. Uh, you could spend a lot of time talking about the IFAC classification. Um, but really, why did we come out, uh, or why did the authors of this come out with a new classification? So um, this was a group of people um, and surgeons from all over the world that came together, put their minds together, all the great minds. Um, Alki speaking um, after me. Claudia Cajecas was one of our fellows who's now a consultant in, um, in uh, Chile. And I have to thank Claudia because I'm using some of his, his slides. He's kindly allowed me to use some of his slides and he's got some brilliant slides, uh, which I want to refer to. So really it was to simplify um, the classifications that we all use terminology that is easily relatable. And we know it's easily relatable because we went on to publish a paper on this to look at the um, international assessment and inter-intra 
uh, race reliability, and it was very good. And that was done by Phil Chen. So in the simplest way of talking about frontal sinus cells, as Tim alluded to again, it's about what do they do to the pathway? Ultimately, when I'm asking um, uh, the residents and trainees to work out the frontal sinus drainage pathway, what I'm saying to them is, where can you put your probe or your curette that allows it to pass freely into a space? And so the way you work that out is by looking at the cellular architecture in that frontal recess. So think about the cells um, in that area. In the simplest way, are they anterior cells? Or are they posterior cells? Or are they medial cells? Okay. Um, so anterior cells, if you think about a cell that sits anteriorly, that's things like the agonese cell and cells related to the agonese. If you have a cell anteriorly, it will push your drainage pathway posteriorly. Posterior cells tend to push the drainage pathway anteriorly, and that will be cells related to the bulla. And then medial cells, such as septal cells, almost always push your drainage pathway laterally because they're sitting in the midline. Okay, so we'll show you that with some examples. So anterior cells push your pathway posteriorly, posterior cells anteriorly, and medially laterally. Okay, so here we have um, a schematic, really, of a um, parasitical view of the um, frontal sinus. And that's the frontal beak area. Um, and we're going to put an agonese cell in here. So here's a simple agonese cell, which is the simplest configuration you can have in the frontal recess. So this is an anteriorly based cell. And you can see that here um, using the image guidance of the position the anterior base cell sits. If you look at this picture, you'll see that any drainage is going to go posterior to this cell. That's fair enough. know that. But it's not always as simple as it. It's not just one anterior cell. You could have a cell above that anterior cell. That's fair enough. That may just be in the old terminology, a coon type one cell. Um, it could be a coon type two. There may be two super agar cells. But these cells just sit above the agonese cell and they still just push your drainage pathway posteriorly. They may push it more posteriorly than before, but it's still just posteriorly. They don't, if you see that, they don't extend into this hashed line area, which is the frontal sinus. They sit below that frontal ostium. So these are just super agar cells. Now, what do they look like here? You can see them. Um, so you can see them there as a simple super agar cell above the agonese cell. But what if your cell extends into the frontal sinus? Then what? Well, is these are still all anteriorly based cells. You don't need to call them anything else. They just become super agar cells. But because it's now going beyond the frontal ostium, we call it a super agar frontal cell. That's it. You don't need to bother whether it's a T3 or T4. It's just a super agar frontal cell. What does it do to your drainage pathway? It still pushes it posteriorly. Okay, so there's your drainage pathway going posteriorly. So here's a schematic I put together. So you can see here, you've got an agonese cell, you've got a super agar frontal cell, and your drainage pathway just slides in behind that at the back. All right, some of these cells, some of these super agar frontal cells, they're quite high. And you may not be able to remove all of the cap of this cell through a standard frontal sinus drainage procedure. You might need to do an extended procedure to remove them. Or you'd be able to remove the bottom part, but not the top part of it. What about posteriorly based cells? So here we have the skull base, posteriorly, or the posterior wall of the frontal sinus, and you have the bulla ethmoidalis. So here's a bulla. There's a super bulla cell. Now, we all knew these, and in days gone by, there were different names to it, uh, Bulla frontalis cells, etc. But this is just a simple Bulla, so super Bulla cell. Now, there's a frontal ostium. The Bulla cells push your drainage pathway anteriorly. So you might find that they cramp between a frontal cell and a Bulla cell. But you should be able to negotiate your pathway between the two. So what does that look like on some images here? So here you have a Bulla ethmoidalis. Uh, and then you have a super bulla cell. That cell does not extend to the frontal sinus, but you can see that there's another cell just anterior to it, which is related to the frontal beak area, so that's an anterior cell. 
Uh, what about this? So here you have a large supra cell. Now this cell is extending through the frontal ostium. So exactly like the supra agar cells, these are called supra frontal cells because they just push up into the frontal sinus. But as before, if you want to access this frontal sinus, you will need to fracture this cell posteriorly. So you need to push and break this backwards. It's very difficult to flick this forward. You just need to be aware that you can push them backwards, fracture them, and open up that drainage pathway. And you might need to do an extended procedure to get the cap of the cell out if they're very extensive. So the drainage pathway is pushed me, um, anteriorly. Here's an example of a patient. When you look at this first of all, this first coronal, this can be quite confusing. You look at this and you think, what on earth is going on here? They've got these two cells high up against the skull base. But if you think about it, this cell is not in contact with the frontal process. It cannot be an anterior cell. All right, it's up against the skull base at the back. The clue here is really looking at the axials. And people don't look at axial imaging enough, but it is the planning image for your frontal sinus dissection because it is the image in the anatomical position of how you're going to dissect your patient. So this is what you're doing when you dissect. You're putting your, your um, frontal sinus probe anteriorly and you're pushing this back. And it shows you beautifully on the parasitial this large bulla and this extension of this bulla coming forward, this super bulla cell, which has cramped this frontal sinus drainage pathway anteriorly. So the two differences, the main things to take away is if you have a super agafrontal cell, you're pushing your pathway posteriorly. If you have a super bulla frontal cell, because it's coming from the skull base and the bulla, you're pushing that pathway anteriorly. You may need to negotiate other cells in between, but that's the key uh, between those two areas. So here are all the cells stuffed into one sinus. Uh, I love this picture of Claudius, and it shows you've got the bulla ethmoidalis, supra bulla cells, super bulla frontal, super agar frontal cells, super agar uh, cell, and agonase. But that is it. That, that, that's all you need to, that's all you need to, to, to understand and learn about. That is it. Um, the needly based cells, the um, septal cells, they're not difficult to work out because they're within the intersinus septum and they push your drainage pathway out laterally. They don't do a lot more than that. What they can do is make your life a little bit easier because they may pneumatize and open up into that frontal sinus drainage pathway on that side. So often they can end up being a little bit more uh, wider on that side. So here we go. Um, that's a drainage pathway and that's a... Uh, uh, the lateral aspect of the drainage pathway. Probably the most, which I know with a lot of consternation about this, is the supraorbital ethmoid. Now, I wouldn't get too excited or too worked about supraorbital ethmoid. Safe to say that if you see a supraorbital ethmoid, you need to think about one thing. And the main thing is, you will often have a long lateral lamella of the cribriform plate and the anterior modal artery is likely to lie in a mesentery. And I'll show you that. So supraorbital ethmoids pneumatize the orbital plate of the frontal bone. So normally your orbital plate of frontal bone and your frontal sinus floor are together. But if you have a supraorbital ethmoid, those areas get pneumatized. I'll show you that. The opening is posterior to the frontal recess or posterior lateral to the frontal recess. Um, and the anterior modal artery is often on the mesentery. So here we go. Here's the frontal sinus area. Here's your frontal area. It's important to understand. It's a transition from the frontal sinus into the frontal recess. So here you've lost your frontal beak. So you've got, I've put a hash line in. Now you're actually in the frontal recess. This is not the frontal sinus. This is the supraorbital ethmoid area. Okay? Because you push the orbit away from the skull base you've pneumatized the orbital plate of the frontal bone. And you can see here in this axial how it pneumatizes all the way around the back. And what you'll notice here is look at the anterior molar artery. It's about 17 times more likely to lie in a mesentery if you have a superorbital ethmoid. So that's probably the most important thing about it is that you need to be aware of your arteries. So in summary, this is a really easy uh, classification to remember. Um, you, it's, it's easy to work with, easy to remember, and 
it's based around where your drainage pathways are and not about the number of cells that you've got going on, which can be quite confusing. So it just describes the cells as a relation anterior and posterior, which essentially influences your drainage pathway. That's it. Stealth Station ENT, the advanced image guidance system for the full range of navigated ENT procedures. Engineered with you in mind, based on decades of scientific, clinical, and engineering expertise, we're expanding what was previously possible with image-guided surgery. Flexible and elegantly designed, Stealth Station ENT streamlines the workflow so you can maintain focus. The flat, under-the-head emitter allows for an efficient setup. Its design allows for a large EM field. Easily find your patient's exam through a variety of network options, super speed USB or optical disc. The visualization and modeling features give you the perspective you need. Leverage data from multiple sources to create high resolution 3D images. View structures and pathology with high fidelity. Registration expertly matches the three-dimensional positioning of the patient with the preoperative images used for navigation. Patient registration combines registration methods and provides numerical and visual accuracy feedback. Leverage the latest technology for advanced surgeries. See more. Do more. The result? You have an image-guided perspective like never before. With Stealth Station ENT, you're at the forefront of ENT surgery. You are Stealth. That was great. Thank you very much for another excellent talk. And I think as, as you've summarized there, it's just, the, the classification system it really highlights what can be seen as a very complex anatomical area and simplifies it. And it's a reproducible classification system that makes the surgery more simple. We just have um, a poll there. Um, if the delegates could possibly fill that out, please. It's on the frontal sinus anatomy and asking which classification do you use to assess the, the anatomy? We just have a few questions, if that's all yep. right. Do, yes, go for you, it. do you have a pro forma that when, when you when you're assessing your CT scans preoperatively for the frontal sinus, will you document it, or is it just form part of your normal routine assessment of the scan? So that's really good, Louise. I see Alki, Professor Alki, uh, just joined us as well, and um, he he will attest to this. So, so what um, what I try and get the um, uh, registrars and what I do myself as well and I do it all the time is I will draw out that drainage pathway for my mind I'll draw it out and I'll stick it on the stack um, and so it's there and when I'm operating I can I can refer to it and I get the trainees to do it as well I did it when I was a, a fellow and I still do it now I find it very useful in my mind because when I think I've worked it out I kind of forget um, and so if I've drawn it out and I know where it is I know I only need to really know what the axial and the parasagittal are doing. The coronal, I can see, um, but it's the axial and parasagittal. So I do have a plan and I draw it out and I get them to draw it out as well. I think that's very good advice. And do you use a surgical navigation system for your endoscopic frontal sinus work? Uh, no, I don't use navigation for the, um, the frontal sinus. I, I, I use them for the, um, for the drill outs. And if there's something a bit tricky, but generally speaking, no, I, I don't use it for no standard frontal sinus stuff. That's great. And just and just lastly, do you do you find that you change your instruments at all based on your pre-op plan, based on the classification system? So would it make you more likely to use, for example, a Rad ninety or a, a specific type of angled spur? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, with a, with a straightforward frontal sinus dissection. Um, I would always, always, and I, I, would, I would suggest you all do the same, is that you have some worm old malleable instruments. They are by way and a margin the most useful instruments 
that I use in the frontal recess because the probe is beautiful. You can, it's much longer than a standard frontal sinus seeker um, and you can, you can bend it in any way. So if you know you've got a really acute angle, you can bend that probe because it's malleable and you don't go bashing into the skull base. So that would be my go-to instrument is those malleable frontal sinus seekers. And then yes, a RAD 60 blade, um, you might need that and that's often really useful. Um, I, I don't tend to use a drill unless I'm gonna make a big hole. But yeah, those instruments I'd say absolutely influence what I do, totally. Fantastic. That's great. Well, thank you very much. That was two excellent talks and we're very privileged to have heard them today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Louise. Um, great to see Alki on. I'm going to stay and listen to his talk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sal. Uh, thank you, Louise.